Interested in finding lost mines and reaping some really fabulous amounts of wealth? Well, if you're going to try that, I recommend that you do it smartly and scientifically and to consider all the facts, both pro and con, good and bad. A while back, I was driving and uh, I was uh, miles from my home and I came across, I, I stopped for a break and I came across this monument and I was curious, uh, an old historic monument, and I went and looked and it was a monument to a lost mine. Now, how do you do that? How do you have a monument to a mine if it's actually lost and no one knows where it is. Well, it was uh, the people who placed the monument said that they thought the monument was generally near where that lost mine was. But the truth is, the actual place where it was the monument was is in a young volcanic area that's you know, not very favorable for hosting gold deposits. Now, some miles away, there's some other areas. There's actually several that are very favorable and have been productive in the past. And so not too many miles away from that monument, tens, maybe twenties of miles, um, there were areas that were much more favorable. Now, do I think that there are really lost mines out there? Yeah, I do. Um, on the other hand, do I think that some of them have kind of grown over the years like a fish story? Oh, I caught a fish this big. Wait, it was this big. Wait, it was this big. Wait, it was this big. You know, the lost mine stories do grow over time like fish stories. Now, do I think that there are some lost mine stories that are just made up out of rumors and exaggerations? Yeah, I think there's some of those too. So how does one sort through legitimate stories, uh, legitimate stories that have been kind of badly exaggerated, and stuff that's just kind of some rumors and uh, hopes and thoughts that have been stitched together and made into a lost mind story? Because there, believe me, there are people who do books and articles and things like that and, and sell maps and make money off of making lost mind stories. And if there's money to be made off of lost mind stories, there are people that are willing to kind of make some stuff up. Uh, you know, it's like fun fiction. You read it and, and you enjoy it, um, but it's not real. But again, I, I totally think that there are some legitimate lost mind stories that are real and, and worth going after. So, you know, I'm, I'm not totally in the nothing but skeptical camp. I just think that if you're going to do this, you need to do it smartly and consider all the, the important items. And so we're going to go over some important items. And uh, I made a kind of a list here. Lost minds, big rewards, but you need to approach it with a general skepticism. To not just believe everything you're told. It's like on the internet, you know. Is everything on the internet true? No, it's not. Is some of what's on the internet true? Yes, it is. You got to kind of sort through and find the stuff that's real. So to approach a lost mind story with some general skepticism and and try to uh, be searching for the kernel of truth. Because I think that there's a lot of mind, lost mind stories that are kind of like that. They have a, a kernel of real fact and truth. And then maybe some layers have been built up and have accreted onto the story and the story's gotten exaggerated. And so you got to search for the kernel of truth because that's what's going to help you find the thing. Now, like I say, lost mind stories are very much like whopper fish stories in that, you know, a find that might have been a really good find gets exaggerated and blown out of proportion until it's just crazy rich. And uh, you need to have that general skepticism and, and consider the probability of exaggeration. Another thing that's really important is favorable geology. You know, if the versions of the story say, well, the mine, the lost mine was over here, and, and you look at the geology, and it's like, yeah, that's not a good place. If, if you just told me, go look for a gold deposit, and you're going to go look here, I'd say, ooh, that's the wrong geology for, for having a gold deposit. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to talk about that kind of stuff. So if you're going to search for 
favorable or search for a lost mine, you want to do it in a place where there's a good chance that a deposit could exist, not in a place where there's a one in a bazillion chance that a pot deposit could exist there because you know your odds of finding some, anything there are pretty low. Another thing is, and this goes with the exaggeration, is to seek the oldest versions of the story. I'm going to look at some Lost Mind stories with you, and we're going to talk about them and consider, you know, early versions and how the, the story changed over time. And, you know, consider that uh, the, usually the oldest versions are the versions closer to that kernel of truth, the original thing that actually happened. Another of the things we want to consider is, why has it remained lost? Um, is it, you know, it, it, it's possible, like when we look at some um, in a minute when we do examples, that the story started out and there were actually other discoveries made in that area. And maybe the story of where the lost mine is, you know, some good discoveries have been made in that general region. Yeah, maybe those good discoveries were actually the areas that the Lost Mind story was based on. So there's different reasons why it remained lost. Uh, one of the things about gold deposits is that they erode and the gold is very durable and lasts. It doesn't weather and disappear. So if you have a gold vein or other kind of gold deposit and erosion happens, it's going to wash material down into the streams or whatever ravines, even if it's in a dry desert area. And you're going to find that downstream from that, there's going to be hints that there's gold further upstream. And prospectors have known about this, you know, for 150 years that you can trace uh, the gold in the stream up, 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 up until you get to the source. And so, you know, one of the things about hiding a gold deposit is even if you totally bury it and hide it of what you see today, because you're going to make it so that nobody else can stumble upon it because you're, you're saving it. And that's great. But 10,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, you know, 30,000 years ago, that vein was being eroded and down into the stream below, into the ravines and other drainages down below. And you, you can bury the vein itself and hide it, but you can't hide the fact that there's gold leading up to it. So, you know, you have questions about why a, a vein has it been lost. Um, and then, they, like I say, that, you know, has it been found but not recognized? So, you know, we're going to talk about some stories that have really old origins. And after the origin story, uh, other deposits were found in that neighborhood. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a thing where maybe those deposits that were found in the neighborhood were the source of that really rich origin story. It's, it's something to consider. So let's talk about some examples now. Okay, so our first example is Gold Lake, which is kind of a unique example because it's one that pretty much everybody agrees was a hoax. Here's a picture of Gold Lake. It's really not the lake that's described in the Lost Mine story, but it's given the name Gold Lake, and it's given that name based on the Lost Mine story. I include the picture because it shows you the country. It's rough, rugged country, high country, high in the Sierras. It's not low down in the valleys. It's up way up high in the pines, but it gives you a feel for the kind of the area that the miners were searching when they were thinking about this lost mine story of Gold Lake. You know, why am I choosing to use a hoax as my example? Well, it kind of shows how these stories can grow and, you know, what may start off as something that sounds pretty good can grow to something that just sounds amazing. And so the story starts this way. A gentleman by the name of Stoddard, oh, in early spring, um, I think that they say around March or, you know, real early before the snow melts, well, when it's still high water. And uh, in 1850, which is when this happened, people were 
you know, they, they didn't stay up in the high country. Uh, this is the early years. You know, the big initial rush was 49. This is the next year, 50. And there's still people rushing in. And so most of the places in the high country, the, the miners came down to the low country, the lower elevations below the snow or below most of the snow, uh, to spend the winter time because the country up in the high country where there was a lot of gold um, was rough, rough country. So early in the spring, way before miners went back to their workings in the high country, this Mr. Stoddard wandered into Nevada City, which is a very productive gold town of its own. He had something like five to ten ounces of big coarse nuggets ranging from uh, maybe a third or four tenths of an ounce up to an ounce or maybe even more than an ounce. He had some nice chunky big pieces of gold and he was showing them around and this was his story that he and a partner had been prospecting up in the high country and had come across an area where there was a little ravine that was leading into a, a lake and in the ravine the the, uh, the water that from the the snow melt had exposed some really big coarse nuggets and they both were really excited and they picked up some nice pieces but before they could even get a whole day in they were attacked by Indians now even in 1850, there were attacks by Indians, but in California, that was a pretty rare thing. It was not, at least in the Sierras, it was not normal, but it did happen. And the guy said, hey, look, I've got this injury on my leg that came from an arrow, and it maybe kind of looked like that, but nobody noticed or nobody made a big deal about the fact that it looked like the injury was a year or more old, that it was completely healed. Well, he claimed that they had, he and his partner had come under attack and they both ran as fast as they could in whatever directions that, that they could and he never saw his friend again. And he wandered through the high country and uh, had come down, you know, he knew he was way too early up in the high country and uh, he'd come down and uh, landed in Nevada City and he showed his gold and people were excited because they knew that there was bigger, coarser gold in the high country. So he, uh, he offered to take some people with him when the weather warmed. Well, they, they took care of him and they, uh, you know, he was the, uh, the toast of the town. And the story spread far and wide. It spread all over the Northern California mines. Uh, there were people 50 and 100 miles away that uh, were keeping track of when the weather would be warm enough that they could go back out and, and search for this, this little ravine. Well, as the story grew and grew and grew, instead of being a little ravine where you could take out ounces of gold in a day, it grew to the fact that this whole lake was just rimmed by nuggets. There was nuggets all along the lake, the whole, you know, the length of the lake, the whole shoreline was just nuggets and you could pick up a thousand dollars a day with ease um, by just going out and, and, and there were nuggets so huge that, that you, you could tie a rope on them and you couldn't pull them out of the water. The story just grew and grew. It really was a fish story that got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and, bigger and even bigger after that. And by the time uh, the spring happened, um, there were, now he, Stoddard only agreed to take 25 people, but there were people that followed their group of 25 in the thousands. In towns all over, you couldn't get a horse, if you didn't own one already, you couldn't rent a horse or a mule uh, to carry your goods. There were just people following him. People abandoned good claims where they were making decent money because of the rumor of the big gold lake. Well, he led them all over, and it was supposed to be up in the high country between the, uh, the middle fork of the Feather and the north fork of the Yuba, and they wandered all over, and there are some lakes in that country. Um, in fact, there are lakes, there's at least two lakes that are named Gold Lake. And, uh, but 
they wandered around and they never really found anything. Now, is the geology favorable in that area? Absolutely. And in fact, um, when the search finally broke up, when uh, what, what happened is they wandered around and wandered around and wandered around, and finally the original 25 uh, came to Stoddard and said, we're giving you one more day. If you don't find it, we're going to string you up and kill you. And, and they really did. Uh, there's several different stories that say that they threatened to kill him. And so the guy disappeared overnight, right? Surprise, surprise. Um, he realized he couldn't find it. And he disappeared into the brush and uh, snuck away so that they wouldn't string him up. But there were a number of really great finds made because it was favorable geology. Now, the oldest version of the story that there was uh, a gold in a ravine that drained into a lake, hey, that's very, very possible. But the story of, you know, nuggets that surround the whole lake and nuggets so big you couldn't pull them out of the water, you know, that was just the story that kept growing. And, you know, you could easily make $1,000 a day. Of course, $1,000 a day in those uh, days, that would be... Uh, 50 ounces of gold a day. 50 ounces of gold a day, that's pretty impressive, right? But uh, like I say, the story grew and grew, and there really were thousands of people that went looking for it. And there really were some really great discoveries made, both placer discoveries um, in the Nelson Creek area, the Rich Bar, the Middle Fork, and several others were discovered, as well as the uh, area known as Johnsville or Plumas Eureka these days, which was a, a, a huge hard rock area that yielded almost a million ounces of gold. But it was from veins, not from a, a lake that was ringed with nuggets. So uh, the original story, uh, I can believe that, that there was a ravine with uh, some nice nuggets. Um, the oldest version of the story, like I say, that it was a ravine, you know, that makes sense. Um, why has it remained lost? Well, you know, there probably are ravines that have been found that have some nice nuggets. In fact, there for sure are ravines in that area that have some nice gold in them. But, you know, it, it's generally accepted because people were uh, so discouraged after, you know, thousands of people went on the search for this amazing gold lake. Um, you know, it, it has remained lost because it never really was like it was described in the exaggerated versions of the story. And it probably, like I say, there probably are little ravines and stuff that may drain into a pond or something else. Because there's, there's a lot of little, you know, depression ponds up there. And there's bigger lakes too. So maybe someone found a ravine that drained into the pond but it wasn't like the story. So, Gold Lake is a great example of how something can start small and then expectations just grow and grow and grow until you get beyond reality to something that is just incredible. But if you're going to search for lost mines, you have to have that general skepticism and search for the original kernel of truth that started the whole thing going. Let's take a look at another example now. All right, our next example is the Lost Cement Mine. And this is the one that uh, I saw the monument for, and, and the actual area where the monument was was not a geologically favorable area. Here's the monument that I saw to the Lost Cement Mine. And, uh, you know, it tells a little bit about the circumstances. This is uh, at least one version of the story that kind of combines some of the stuff that uh, Mark Twain talked about. And we'll go over that. Uh, but let me show you what the area looks like. This is the view around Mono Lake. Um, some of this is really young volcanics, except the black stuff on the right side is, is really young volcanics. Um, and, and there are... Uh, some areas around here with a little bit older volcanics and some granitic rocks that are favorable for hosting gold and silver deposits. And so uh, while some of the area around here is not very favorable, there are some areas and some uh, famous districts here like the Aurora Esmeralda district or uh, Bodie and, and some others. But this story has been told for a long, long, long time. It was an early day story. In fact, 
Mark Twain, who was in the area in the early 1860s, had already heard of the story and knew people that were chasing it. Um, it it's from an era that is even earlier. It goes back to like the the early 1850s, uh, 1851, 52, when uh, when the the big gold rush to California was still on. I mean, the big rush was 49, but there were still lots of people coming in in 50, 51, 52, 53. Um, in fact, I think in 53, my great great grandfather, no, three great 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 grandfather, uh, came out west from back east uh, searching for a, a lost gold mine. He didn't find anything, and after a few months went home. But uh, still, it, there were lost mine stories that were circulating in the early days, and the lost cement is one of them. The story is that two or three, because some versions have three brothers, some versions have two brothers, uh, of German descent uh, were coming west um, during the time of the big gold rush. And they came and did not follow real well some of the trails. They kind of got off on their own and headed west uh, looking for some place that they could, you know, make a big strike. Well, in the area around Mono Lake, and it doesn't really specify real well um, where exactly around Mono Lake, and Mono Lake is in the eastern California, kind of in the central eastern part, uh, not far from, actually from the Nevada border. And so these guys found this vein, it was supposed to be wide as a curbstone, and it was just shot through with gold, and it was red, and to them it looked like lava, but I can see an oxidized um, high iron vein with minimal quartz, with some quartz, but maybe not that much, looking to someone who wasn't very geologically adept, uh, like it was some kind of lava. And in those days, a lot of the early prospectors believed that the nuggets uh, of gold were shot out of a volcano and there's actually cities, uh, gold rush towns of Volcano and Volcanoville because they thought that this was near the, the gold volcano that shot the nuggets up in the air and that's how you ended up with these blobby shaped nuggets because molten gold shot out of them. Now these days uh, geologists would, you told them that story, they would just laugh. But uh, in those days the early day miners that didn't have a lot of geology skill would believe stuff like that. But uh, there was this vein and that it had lots of gold in it. It was super rich. Uh, the brothers uh, took some samples, whether it was two or three, uh, and, and only one of the brothers made it back to civilization. Um, they endured hardships. So supposedly one of them broke his leg. And, and of course, in those days, if you were out in the middle of nowhere and your leg broke, you were just dead. That, that was it. Um, so they made it back to, the one guy made it back to civilization. He had samples of this vi rich vein and he was sick himself. And so uh, the versions say he gave it to one guy by the name of Whiteman. Another version says he gave a, a map to a guy named uh, Randall. And uh, the, the search was on for the lost cement. And uh, in Mark Twain's book, Roughing It, he tells a great story about uh, when he was in Aurora, or, or Esmeralda as he calls it, uh, when he was in that area, which is, that's a little bit east of Mono Lake, that everybody was looking for this Mr. White Man, that he would sneak into town to get supplies, and but he had to sneak and do it at night and be really careful because whenever he left town, hundreds of people would follow after him because supposedly he knew where this super rich lost cement mine was. Well, from, uh, from Twain's description, it sounds like he was still looking. And, uh, and, and it's questionable whether or not, you know, the actual lost cement has ever been found. But the original story, the kernel of truth, the, the early day German guys that passed through and found some rich vein material, and there's probably a pretty decent chance of it. Um, I'm sure that it's been exaggerated because later uh, stories say that the, the vein is, you know, two-thirds gold by weight. It's just full of gold and it's 
there's hardly any vein, it's mostly gold. Well, you know, you can get small amounts of stuff like that, but there's not, you know, rich pockets do exist, but, you know, huge amounts of stuff that's mostly gold by weight, you know, that's not very common, not very unusual. Um, in the area where the monument was, like I say, that's not favorable on geology, but there is favorable geology in the general area. And of course, there were great finds made at Esmeralda in years after the brothers passed through. And there weren't trails through, so they just kind of blazed their way. And so their maps or indications of where they were were pretty rough and crude. And, and uh, it was, so I think that you know, there's also other uh, rich areas there, uh, Monoville, Dogtown Diggings, of course Bodie was really rich. I have a friend who found a specimen at Bodie that was shot through with gold that, you know, might have been similar to what the brothers found. So maybe the real discoveries were made after they passed through at Esmeralda, at Aurora, or Bodie, or mono diggings or you know any the Ticonderoga was supposed to be super huge, super rich in the early days so there's a lot of different areas there where big finds have been made and maybe one of those big finds was the thing that the brothers found maybe it wasn't if I were gonna look I would look in the favorable geology areas uh, on the fringes of Bodie, or actually Bodie's a state park, so more like the fringes of Aurora or the fringes of, you know, some of the other gold-rich areas that are in that Mono Lake region. It's entirely possible, like I say, that some of the discoveries, the well-known discoveries, were of the find that the brothers made, just weren't recognized to be the same as what they found. So, you know, Mono Lake is an interesting area. And certainly there's been some good gold found in that region. And, you know, there's some favorable areas there. And so that would be a good place to look. But not where the monument is in the, the young volcanic rocks that, you know, erupted 10,000 years ago. It's geologically young. Not in those rocks, in the older rocks, in the same kind of rocks where the gold veins have been found. So our next example is going to be the Lost Dutchman, probably the most famous, uh, the famous, most famous lost mine in all the U.S. Um, at least if you measure it by the number of times the story has been told. Uh, let's take a look at a few pictures just to get started and get a feel for it. This is a view of the Superstition Range taken from, you know, near Apache Junction, uh, east of Phoenix. You can see that it's a really rugged mountain range with plenty of cactus and uh, there's no roads really going up in here. In fact, a lot of this area is a wilderness area and so there's access only by trail on foot or by horseback. There are many trails going up into these mountains and literally thousands of people have come here over the years searching for the Lost Dutchman Mine or actually some of the people come here just to enjoy the beauty of the rugged mountains. Okay, now I'm going to probably get in a little bit of trouble on some of this because there are people who are just total believers in uh, the Lost Dutchman. Now, do I think that there's a kernel of truth, you know, the the origin story kernel of truth yeah i do i think that there's that uh, you know uh, jacob waltz the the dutchman um he was actually german but uh, a lot of times people who are deutschmen germans uh were called dutchmen because deutsch and dutch were so close together people didn't realize the difference but anyway the dutchman himself uh jacob waltz uh, he was a prospector and he did find some stuff. He was not super wealthy. It wasn't like he lived in a, you know, a three-story mansion with servants all around him. In fact, he was a pretty much a loner, but he, he was not poor and he, he did okay. Uh, so I think he did find some gold, but the question is, how much and what kind and how much has the story changed? I mean, there are versions of the story 
where what, what, what he found were big nuggets. He found lots of nuggets of gold. There's versions of the story where he found, of course, a gold mine, a rich gold quartz mine. There's versions of the story where he didn't really find a mine. He just stashed or maybe came upon a stash of high-grade quartz someplace in the Superstition Mountains. And, and so you start right there, it's like, well, what did he actually find? You know, that because there's different things. And then um, there's different maps that were made. Uh, the story is, is that, you know, he probably had some success and that it, toward the end of his life when he was in his 80s, he ended up uh, contracting pneumonia, which is really serious today, but a lot more serious in 1890. Um, 1891, uh, and and he was under the care of a lady named Julia Thomas, who was a friend of his, and and she took care of him when he was sick, and actually was there, you know, and taking care of him until he passed, and uh, during his last days, he uh, supposedly told her this story of how he had made this rich find and uh, gave her some information about how to find it and you know that she could go back and trace it and you know then uh, uh, he passed away well afterwards she went out and looked for it but she didn't have any luck finding it now the the question is you know what's the deal with this you know he was sick he needed the lady to take care of him was he exaggerating a story in order to make sure that she took care of him while he was sick because he didn't have any other immediate people in his family or immediate you know people that would take care of him she was the one so was it a motivation to help her you know want to take care of him and people have made money over off this over the years. Uh, Miss Thomas uh, later sold all kinds of maps of where even after she went out and looked for it and was unsuccessful, she kind of took the information that he gave her and kind of made it into a map. And this is what she thought and what she used to go out. And so she sold a lot of these maps and I'm sure made more than enough money to pay for the time that she spent on Mr. Waltz. Uh, other people have made money. There's was these weird Peralta stones, which there was a, a, a Hispanic family that lived in the area in, in 50 years and more before uh, Jacob Waltz passed away. And they uh, supposedly mined some nice gold in the superstition area. And uh, there was, uh, in, 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 the, in their days, the Apaches were really dangerous and uh, settlers often paid the price when they had an encounter with them. And, and so the Peralta supposedly had this encounter and you know, it was a massacre. And the story is, is that uh, uh, in the late 1940s, I think it's 49, these stones with various engravings and cryptic and a little bit of Spanish written on them, some of it wildly misspelled, uh, and the, the year 1847 marked on there. And, and, and so uh, these stones show up and they're not really anything, you know, people interpret them as a map, but there's nothing on them that, you know, says this way to the treasure or map to the rich mine or anything like that. And so the real horrible problem with this story of the, uh, the lost Dutchman mine is that it's dang near impossible to get to the kernel of truth. It's been told and retold and retold and retold. Uh, there are 101 different versions of it. Like I say, there's uh, versions that have him finding nuggets, versions that have him finding a quartz vein, versions that have him finding a stash. There's versions that he has a partner. There's versions that he murdered his partner. There's versions that the Apaches murdered his partner. There's all these different versions. There's versions that he found the Peralta's lost mine. Uh, and that's what his mine was. 
you know there, there's so many different versions and it's been told so many times you have the effect of not only as i talked about the fish story that we found this much oh, wait we found this much oh, wait we found this much and no it's this much and uh, it's not only that but it's the telephone thing too where where joe tells tom tom tells fred Fred tells Dave, Dave tells Mike, Mike tells, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. And like the old game of telephone, where you tell somebody something and it goes long, long. And, and as the story goes around, it, it changes a little bit. And, and that's kind of what's happened to the, the lost Dutchman as well. So like I say, I really do think he found something. Is it a million billion dollar worth mine? No, I think a lot more money's been spent searching for it than there probably really was there to begin with. It's said that he had some of the versions of the story is he had a footlocker with 26 pounds of super rich ore that was under his bed. Well, okay, let's say it's the super, super richest and it's a, 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 an ounce per pound of rock. That's super duper rich. It's very unusual rich. Um, so it's 26 ounces and at the $20 uh, an ounce, which was what the rate, the, the price of pure gold was at the time, uh, that would have been $520. Now in 1890, $520 was a substantial amount. You could buy a house for that. Uh, but it, it wasn't like something that would make you rich and you could live with servants and a big multi-story house and you know, uh, you know that it's, it's enough for him to have a house and have some land, which he did and do some farming. And that's assuming that the rock was super duper duper rich. Maybe it wasn't quite that rich, but 26 pounds is not that much. Um, and, and maybe there was more to be found, but is there another 100 pounds to be found, another 500? You know, pocket mines are notorious. And then there have been pocket mines in Nevada, pocket mines in California, Arizona, you know, uh, lots of places, New Mexico, Oregon, where you, you know, you can find these areas in, and there may be a vein and the may, the vein as a whole may have a little bit of gold in it enough, maybe even enough for commercial operation, but there'll be bits and pieces where there's a patch that's just super duper rich, you know, and, and those are your pockets of super rich gold. And I think maybe Waltz found a pocket or two of super rich gold and, and wanted to maybe help the lady that took care of him find it. But you know, it wasn't that much. One of the things that too about mines and searching for mines is, you know, gold, as I've said, it, uh, gold remains. It erodes out and goes into drainages. And prospectors have known about testing drainages for hundreds of years. And so drainages have been tested. Um, you can cover up a vein outcrop and hide it, but you can't hide what's happened for the 15,000 years before you got there and all the material drained into various drainages. And, and so the, the core area of the superstitions where supposedly this thing is, for at least for a lot of people, is there's never been any significant gold found in that. The, there has been on the outer parts of the, uh, the superstitions, there's some gold districts and some gold has been mined. There's the mammoth mine there. And perhaps uh, the mammoth or some pockets around there is, is what uh, Waltz found. We don't know and it's hard to trace. And so sometimes with stories that have become so, so popular and retold and retold and changed and modified and stuff added to it and uh, you know, all this other stuff, it's hard to trace it back. So I don't know. I don't know that I would say the Dutchman is worth going after just because it's so difficult to get down to that kernel of truth that's the foundation story. Our next story we're going to talk about is the Gabs Valley, a place called I Own. This is a book I bought years ago. It's got a great lost mine and lost treasure combined story in it. And uh, uh, what, what it is is that there was a, a guy and his partner were working on a little gold vein. They hit a rich pocket and took out uh, a thousand ounces worth of gold, which that's a huge amount. And they 
decided like a lot of miners do to go on a spree and just spend and have money and you know they worked hard in the desert and this this occurred in the Ion Valley area which is near Gabs and uh, they were out there and they they decided they were just going to go to San Francisco and have a wild time and they did but one of the guys while drunk fell on the ground and got run over and killed and so the story was that the, the of course you know having your partner having a wild time with your buddy and you know just playing the town and having a great time and then having your partner die that's yeah that's uh, <laughs> really gonna put a damper on things so he um, came back to town and went back to work at the mine and he had about a thousand twenty dollar gold pieces which he deposited at the big city there was a store nearby that he got food and stuff at and the lady that ran the store had a big huge uh, safe and he had her store his gold for him and she did because he would come in and you know buy groceries and things from her so you know it was worth it she had his money already in advance and she didn't cheat him or anything but uh you know he knew how much money he had eventually he got to the point where he thought you know it's probably not safe for me to leave all this money and he took the money with him now when the money was at the store and in the safety deposit box there were people who saw it so there's there's uh and and the person who wrote the book uh, interviews some of them or talks to them and so they there's good grounding that they saw the the giant pile of 20 dollar gold pieces and there's good grounding that he took them back to his claim and he hid them someplace there probably not too awful far from where his cabin was and when he passed away and it was learned that he'd passed a lot of people went out there and went looking for uh his treasure that he'd hid and you know to see if the mine was any good and it just didn't nobody ever found anything so there's something that you know the kernel of truth is pretty much there it's not been exaggerated a lot and there's good reason for it an explanation and if you want to get more details that uh, gabs valley uh, uh history and legends you can buy there at least i could i bought it on amazon uh, it's an interesting story and the whole book is actually interesting it has a lot of mining stuff in it too so there's an interesting stuff there but the, getting back to this whole story of lost mines and searching for lost mines you know there's there's definitely places and times where it's worthwhile to to do that and there's definitely places and times where there's been so much exaggeration and retelling of the story like the lost dutchman that uh you know it's probably not worth it and so you have to judge for yourself using these uh logical reasonings you know keeping having this skepticism and searching for the kernel of truth looking at what potential is for exaggeration uh, using the geology of the area to look for what's favorable geologically um, seeking the oldest versions of the story because those are often going to be reflecting the kernel of truth that they were founded on um, considering why has it remained lost or maybe that it's been found you know the, there are people with the lost dutchman who think that uh, the mammoth and some of the other mines were what waltz probably found or what the peraltas probably worked and they were worked later and produced significant gold not crazy wild insane amounts of gold but good good profitable amounts of gold for the people who ran the mine so considering all those and considering our examples i wish you the best of luck in going out and finding a lost mine i hope you have more success than a lot of other people do now in finding lost mines or finding any mine in finding gold just in general it's a skill it's a, a, a knowledge that you have the more you know the better off you're going to be and to impart that skill to you um you know my 40 plus years of experience my degree in mining engineering and that kind of stuff i wrote a book called fistful of gold and i'm going to tell you a little bit more about my book right now this is my book fistful of gold it's an encyclopedia of everything you need to know to go out and find gold for yourself it distills down my 45 years of experience out in the field prospecting as well as my degree in mine engineering it's 
like I say, an encyclopedia, there's a lot to it. It's over 250,000 words long, uh, hundreds of pages with hundreds of illustrations uh, teaching you what you need to know about geology, about mining districts, about techniques of finding gold. It covers metal detectors, uh, sluicing, panning, dry washing, high bankers, you know, you name it, it's covered in there. It talks of some about platinum and diamonds, but it's mostly about gold because gold is more widespread. It uh, is not so much a book about where to find gold, but a book about how to find gold. Because even if you have a location where gold was mined in the past and you go out there, well, where should you look to be successful in your prospecting, to find the gold that's there? This is the book that's gonna tell you that information. I spent most of 10 years writing this book, so I, I thought a long time about it. It's got, uh, like I say, lots of information and lots of illustrations, and I've had results from people who bought it. Um, it's available on Amazon, but I recommend buying it through High Plains Prospectors, and I'll put a link in the description for buying this book through them. They have a better price than Amazon, and I have a special deal that I'll tell you a little bit more about where I can get a, you can get a 5% discount uh, from the price even with that. On Amazon, the book rates a 4.7 out of five, which means that of all the people that have bought it, they've been really highly satisfied. And I think you, if you buy my book, will be just as highly satisfied as well. Now let's talk a little bit more about High Plains Prospectors. They're a prospecting shop, a mail order prospecting shop that I've partnered with. Uh, that The deal is that I can get you a 5% discount uh, a coupon code and I'm going to put the code to that right here. It's just Chris Ralph, all caps with no space between Chris and Ralph. Uh, you put that in there as a discount code and you'll get 5% off their already really good prices. I think it's a great deal where you win by getting a discount. I get a little percentage of that and they get new business. So if you need prospecting supplies, High Plains is really the way to go. And I'll put information, like I say, in the description, more about how you can work with them. Because I'm working with them, uh, they really are great guys, a great company. For even more information, I also have a website, and I'm gonna show you my webpage and talk a little bit more about that right now. This is my webpage. It's located at nevadaoutbackgems.com. You can Google it or I have a link down in the description below. But there's lots of information here, miscellaneous stuff, pictures, some historic information as well, stories. Um, it's got a lot of great fun stuff. Uh, you'll probably be interested in it. Now on all of my YouTube videos, I encourage you guys to ask questions. If you have thoughts, comments, um, you know, suggestions for things that I ought to look at in my videos, uh, things that uh, you want to find out more about, and I answer 100% of my questions. There's not very many uh, YouTubers out there that answer 100% of their questions. I'm one of the few. And so I will do my best to answer what you have. I mean, uh, I only can write so much. Um, sometimes the answer is something where I'm gonna recommend that you buy the book and read about it. I also ask that you subscribe to my channel, uh, click the bell notification so that every time I come out with a new video, uh, you'll be able to watch it. And like I say, I cover a huge amount of topics. I also have 250 videos that I've already done. And so you can go back through my catalog of videos on YouTube. I'm sure there'll be many videos there that you'll want to take a look at, especially if you have any interest in gold or platinum, diamonds, gemstones, geology, and that sort of stuff. My YouTube site is gonna be right up your alley. So I'll see you again real soon. Uh, we'll be out in the field and I'm back in the office uh, at the whiteboard. And whether we're looking at gold or platinum, diamonds, gemstones, or other interesting geology, it's gonna be fun. You're gonna enjoy it and we'll see you again real soon.